uh, welcome to our, this talk I have on NetBSD. I am Phil Nelson, not Dylan Eskew. Dylan uh, is the student who did a lot of this work under my supervision, and he was not able to make it. And so I'm here to kind of tell you some of what he did in this area. And so in some of it, I'm not going to be able to tell you as much as he could have, but I will tell you as much as I know. So we'll then move on here. And uh, this is kind of the quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. I'm not going to take much time to talk about that, because we're going to start off here on NetBSD. Now, I'm assuming that most of you know what NetBSD is, because this is BSD CAN. But just kind of a quick review and kind of my involvement in NetBSD. Um, um, oops, there we go. In April 20, 1993, BSD, uh, NetBSD 0.8 came out. And it was in that time frame when I actually joined. Um, the official NetBSD 1.0 came out 30 years ago. Um, it had five architectures, which included a PC 532 port. Um, PC 532 is a really weird home-built computer that was done by, it was actually a net build computer. Some guys got together and uh, designed a PC board, and then we all bought parts, and we all soldered them on and built it up. And I was wanting to find a home for a better OS than the Minix that was running on it, and in the process of trying to get something up and going, I started with 386 BSD and quickly found a syscall bug that I wasn't able to try to figure out totally what was going on. And so I started casting out to try to find people. And I found NetBSD that says, oh, cool, a new architecture. Let's get you in here. So um, I believe I'm number six developer on the NetBSD project. So that's, that's when it happened. Then, of course, we went to 2.0 when we finally changed from the 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 et cetera, numbering. That was in 2004. At that point, we had the 17 architectures with 54 different systems. And then going to this year here, we're now at 16 CPU architectures. And we now have tier supports, which says tier one are the well-supported. Everything's really great. The other one, they kind of, yeah, they're somewhat supported. They're um, going along kind of at their own speed. And uh, then there's no tier three, which says they're kind of, uh, going away. It turns out that the PC-532 ended up in tier three way a long time ago and totally disappeared before. I think it actually, its last official one was in 1.5, although there's been some noise on the PC-532 front in just this year where people have actually started running B NetBSD again on this device. So, you know, you never know when things are going to come back to life. Anyway, so. Um, moving on then, let's look about the RISC-V. Many of you probably already know, probably as much or more than I know about the RISC-V here. Um, it started at UC Berkeley as a teaching example in their parallel lab. It was actually, uh, apparently by reading their documentation, they were actually interested in parallelism, not necessarily a new architecture. And it then managed to morph into an open source specification, royalty free, and then controlled by the Risk Five Foundation. Okay, and so we come from Berkeley. Um, the BSD groups come from there. Well, so does the Risk Five come from Berkeley. So I guess it's a nice match to put BSDs on the Risk Five. Kind of following our, our history there, um, it's got privileged and uh, user level ISAs. Um, the user level ISA actually is very modular. There's a bunch of sets of, here's the core ISA, and here's different sets of ISAs that you, you can put on there. And then there's the privileged ISAs, and then there's extensions. And so it's a, it's a pretty big uh, collection of a variety of different things, and it's changed quite a bit over time. The, one of the things that, uh, for me, is, was very interesting was that it had the three different levels of machine, supervisor and user mode, and that this would be different operating levels of, of where it's going on. And uh, <clears throat> this uh, provides, of course, your basic idea of the machine can be your hypervisor, your uh, supervisor can be your OS, and then, of course, through your standard user level. So most OS is typically run in the supervisor user area there, although I ended up, uh, it's not part of this talk, but I ended up uh, last year 
actually take that back, fall of 2022, I wrote a little mini OS using the RISC-V where the kernel ran in machine mode and user space ran in users. I was trying to essentially do something that nobody else did so I could keep my students from cheating. And that's really exactly the core reason I wrote my own. And so I could then say, here, you need to implement this stuff here. And so I've had a little experience playing with these different modes on the RISC-V, because we're actually run on the RISC-V. Um, and so um, the other interesting thing is there's a hardware level memory security that you can actually, in machine mode, if you don't give the right hardware accesses, you can't actually use that memory. I actually discovered that when I couldn't use memory and my stuff. It's like, well, why can't I use this memory? Well, you didn't give the right hardware accesses to it. So that's an interesting thing in there. And then they say that we want to, they, RISC-V says they want to do portability, so they've done several different things in there. Flattened device trees and the RISC-V software binary in interface. Those are things we're going to talk about later. Okay, so let's move on here. And let's look at the history of the port. Um, so it started back in 2014. I've heard people say it started in 2015. I actually went back and looked at the commits. And the first commit uh, was actually September 19, 2014. Um, Matt Thomas did this. He actually had several commits through that time through uh, March 2015. This was on the uh, early RISC-V ISA. And it was still, at that time, subject to change. And it really actually did change. Okay, And so then I was looking for further commits. And the next commit that I, I there's several commits in this area. But the next one of note to me was Nick Hudson. He committed, started committing in late March 2015. And there was some minor work uh, done in there. I went and looked. and was trying to see how many commits were at various different years in there. And like I think 2016 had like five files that were had a commit on them. And then there was a hundred and some in the next year, and then six files the next year. And so it took a while before things really kind of uh, took traction. Part of that happened uh, when Zach McGrew, uh, who was also a, U a Western Washington University graduate student, started working on this. I convinced him to uh, do this because having done the 530, PC 532 port, um, I was interested in doing ports. And by the way, just in case you don't know the terminology for NetBSD, a port is getting the OS running on a new architecture or a new system where a package is, the, is kind of the same thing that uh, FreeBSD uses for ports. So I'm, that's kind of the things I keep forgetting to mention here. Um, but so. Zach worked on this in the uh, 2017 to 2018 timeframe. It was an updated ISA in that area. And one of the things at the time he to do this, there were no build tools inside the NetBSD tree. There was the standard stuff, but you couldn't build it for the RISC-V. So he had to do a whole bunch of work outside the NetBSD tree to even get a, a cross-build tool setup set up to deal with it. And then at that point, they were targeting the spike. Uh, emulator. And so there was all kinds of stuff he worked with. He worked a very long time on doing a bunch of stuff. He managed to get it to the point where NetBSD was booting to the point that it would go, I want to, I want to um, actually mount the root file system. And uh, at that point, he ran out of time in his uh, grad program. And we said, uh, well, OK, I guess you've made it at least a part, part of the way there. And we're going to go for there. The, thing that that did, though, is uh, Nick uh, found inspiration from this. Um, Zach presented at BSD CAN 2019 his work. And uh, we can actually see some of the commits in the trees from Nick is referencing some of the work that Zach did in getting this up and going. So at that point, it was actually running to the point where it's, well, we've got to get the, the, the next step in there, which I thought was a pretty good one. And there are several other, a uh, couple others of import to talk about here. Simon Burge, who is actually also involved in the PC-532. He did the interrupt driver chip. Uh, Jared McNeil actually did some flattened tr uh, device tree. Um, maybe that's, I bet that's the, got those rep inverted there. Sorry about that. Anyway, and so it was adapted by Nick in here. And then in looking at here, I see that there is actually 22 unique committers in the actual RISC-V stuff. So 
Some of them are just comments or moving some stuff around, but there's probably, I'm probably missing some people in here who've actually done some, some good commits, but that's uh, unfortunate. I'll have to actually uh, um, ask your um, forgiveness for not mentioning you here. Anyway, so in looking back at here then, we found that the mailing list actually was, the first post was uh, 13th of February, 2019. So this was uh, quite, in, quite a bit into this process here. And so looking kind of at what happened here and looking through the thing there, uh, and looking through the uh, port, excuse me, the mailing list, uh, December 2 is when Nick said that he now finally had NetBSD up running slash rescue on QEMU. So that was one of the things that Nick did. Um, Zach had it running on Spike, and then Nick said, no, we want to go toward QMU, so there was some work to get it going on QMU. And so this is where we first got it running from rescue, which of course means none of the, the uh, shared libraries or anything are working, just rescue. And then by the 15th, um, he had it running um, essentially multi-user at that point on QMU. And then February 20, he basically said, uh, of the next year, he basically said, okay, it's now stable on QMU, now he starts to work on actual real hardware, okay? And it was in this time frame when I convinced Dylan to try to help see if we can get this working on some real hardware, okay? And so let's look at some of the technology and then we'll look at Dylan's efforts to get some of this stuff running on, on uh, real hardware here. So virtual memory. Um, virtual memory is basically um, multi-level page tables. There's a bunch of these different things. SV32 is actually very similar to the I386 uh, page table stuff. It's got the, the minor details different, but the, the whole kind of total structure is essentially the same. And so then they've added a 39-bit uh, virtual address space, a 48-bit virtual address space, and a 57-bit uh, virtual address space. And so each of those levels go different. So SV32 has a two-level page table structure. SV39 has a three-level page table structure. SV48, of course, has four and then five, and then I believe the full 64 will have then the six. Okay, and so I don't know that they've actually done the full 64 yet, but that's what, what things are getting ready for. Um, PMAP Common was done by Matt Thomas. That's, again, the name who started this. Um, one of the things I did not personally do on the PC532 port was the PMAP thing. Somebody did that for me. I don't remember if it was Simon or not. It could have been Simon that did the uh, PMAP element, but it was like, oh, I don't even have to worry about that. Somebody did it for me. Now, we, the PC532 used the National Semiconductor 32532, we could basically lift almost exactly what the i386 did. I don't know which one of them swiped the stuff, but essentially the PMAPs would have been identical for them. Um, and so once NetBSD started getting a bunch of different PMAPs, Matt Thomas goes, you know, hey, we need to do this thing where here's the common stuff that's, there's common PMAP stuff that we got to do. We don't need to implement it all the time every for every port. Let's make it common. And so that ended up making it portable and that actually Nick got this working on the RISC-V by using um, the PMAP common. He actually had a few bugs he had to fix to get it working because when you throw it on a new architecture, you're going to find probably a few bugs. But that's what really helped uh, Matt get, excuse me, Nick, the PMAP common work that Matt Thomas did gets it there so that it became real easy to run, a, produce a PMAP that worked with a multiprocessor uh, environment. Okay, so current support right now in NetBSD is only for SV39. That's a 64-bit address space. I mean, excuse me, a 64-bit machine, but it's only the 39-bit virtual address space. So both the kernel and the user space are running in this 39-bit address space. But that's plenty of room for most of what we need to do. Um, the RISC-V software binary inf interface is also another thing that is of import in looking at this. 
This is a specification done by the RISC-V Foundation. And the idea was, is because there are various different kinds of implementations of the RISC-V architecture, you could choose whatever you're doing, that what you want is you want the supervisor mode software to be portable across these different implementations. So you just want to say, we don't care what the machine mode looks like. We want the supervisor, and then, of course, the OS running in supervisor mode will provide the user level thing. So kind of both of those levels are abstracted out. So if you use this software binary interface, then you don't have to worry about some of the low level hardware stuff because the SBI is going to take care of it for you. And so that's, that's the idea here. So your bootloader then would basically do the following thing. Your bootloader would boot in machine mode, get the stuff go. It would then boot your next stage in the supervisor mode. And then it provides the bootloader or whatever is that level is providing then the machine level interface to get access to the stuff. So you would end up having Essentially, instead of having a full hypervisor under there, you would have a bootloader that kind of acts like a hypervisor or whatever it is. It's trying to provide this. So it provides the SBI interface to the kernel to be able to do what it does. And so the idea, of course, it improves portability because you just have to write your stuff against SBI. You don't have to worry about what the actual machine level stuff is actually going at. Well. Um, that's what, what they're looking at. So the other thing that was in here is the access to the supervisor was basically through e-calls, e-call instructions. So it really looked like um, kind of an OS call to your lower level OS. So you now have two levels of e-calls coming in here. Um, the trap was generated and then processed by the, the machine mode software, just like OS would do. Um, the idea here was that they would do some easy I.O. So there's a get chair car and get put char from serial output. So you didn't have to worry. You could do serial I.O. without even having to have a, a driver. You could just kind of ask it for. And there is a bunch of other things that it actually put in there. I don't know the entire full list of it. Um, but uh, there was the Berkeley binary uh, Berkeley bootloader that came along. And in this particular case, this was the one that Zach was using, was the Berkeley bootloader, BBL. <laughs> one of the things that would have to happen here is the kernel would be statically compiled into the BBL. So when you would boot this BBL, the BBL would come up and run, and then it would start the kernel running because it had direct access to it, and it would then get it up and running. And so you had to build your bootloader with your kernel. You couldn't just kind of go in and, uh, here's a new kernel. Here's what I want to do um, and use it. You had to actually go in and then um, compile it in. And so that was one of the things that Zach was doing a lot. Well, OpenSBI came along and it says, we don't want you to have to necessarily do that. And so that, that's um, what it went there. So here are some of the, uh, oops, did we go back there? Oops, sorry, get this thing here. I went just too far. So here is the RISC-V. Uh, open SBI in here, and I wasn't expecting it to be a different color, but there you go. Um, it's just for completeness sake here. Flattened device trees, uh, do we have a question or? Okay. Um, flattened device trees, that is another thing that was, came along here. Those of you who've used ARM, the little small computers in ARM probably are familiar with this because that's where I believe it probably originated, but it's a data structure for describing hardware. So those in the, this area decided we wanted to do this. So SBI says, hey, let's use this so that SBI is not hardware specific. We can actually use these flattened device trees to get the information we needed to go with. So they're typically compiled into a blob that's available someplace on the, uh, the device, wherever you uh, put them. Um, and then the blobs are by the bootloader or some other thing loaded into memory. And then your OS and the SBI can then use these blobs to figure out what's going on in there. And so uh, these are the device tree things here as an example of kind of what they look like. Here is uh, a set of, now this is the readable version. This is the version that you would go for. And then this gets compiled into it an appropriate thing. So there's a lot of stuff that goes in here that describes these things here. And so that's one of the things that 
was something that you had to work with to get NetBSD up and running on this architecture. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so when I got Dylan working, we actually had a couple of SI5 High 5 Unleashed sitting around our department. We had a couple people who decided they wanted to spend the money on those, and I was not one of those. But there was a couple of uh, people who did, and so it's like, well, hey, if NetBSD is already running or almost running on QEMU, let's see if we can actually get it running on hardware. We have the hardware. We have it. It's getting close to do it. Let's actually get it running on the hardware. So this was the job that I tasked uh, Dylan to do, was get it running on the uh, High 5 Unleashed. What do we have for there? Well, we have a four core plus one core design. The four cores were performant cores that were to do most of the execution, but then there was this one core that was the monitor core. It had a different ISA set. If I remember collect correctly, it lacked floating point instructions. And so you had this mismatch in kind of what the cores are doing. It had an SD card receptacle and a micro USB port. And so it was like, okay, we're trying to get the connections out of this one here. Now, we're gonna find some of Dylan's humor in a, mo in a moment here. Um, so interfacing this, we have the following thing here. So the on onboard uh, USB would be serial in and out and then JTAG. Um, we get in there the, with the, the serial in and out would do you know sc the screen program. It's supposed to be simple, easy, it works great. And then on top of that, if you want to do any debugging, you have open OCD, which is the on-chip debugger in GDB. So you can have kind of run your GDB and get it there. And it sounds great. And then, of course, he started trying to use it. And that's what he said, said about it. It just was, this is where he spent most of his time trying to do it, so trying to actually get in there. We actually got to one point where they were, he was having so much trouble. He says, you know, you gotta go back and try running Linux on it to see if the hardware is actually even working. Okay, and he finally went back and did that. And he actually did make it through the stuff in here. So let's look at the open OCD to see kind of what's going on here. This is in the firmware, supposed to be hardware debugging. Um, SI5 provides a script for the High 5 It's in the flash bootloader and you can start the GDB server. And so you should be able to get in and watch what's going on when it, when it gets up and starts running, okay? Um, the issue apparently is you don't wanna provide a bootloader. Well, open OCD will corrupt your onload, onboard bootloader instead, okay? And so all of a sudden you're, you're not being able to actually run a bootloader here with the open CD. And of course, this is one of, another one of his, uh, Dylan's uh, things here. So GDB works though, right? Well, not, not really, because you end up having the problem of unable to attach to interesting cores, and apparently the, uh, the core that didn't have the um, floating point would get in the way of trying to debug it, and so the debugger wouldn't do the right stuff. And then of course, um, let's see here, that you know, you're reading the symbols, retarget here, at BFD requires that them. This is kind of his thing of, well, can we get there? Maybe not. Okay, well, the next one is High 5 Unleashed has multiple architectures. I guess this was one of the other things here. Good at reading assembly code. Now, I didn't see any assembly code in here, but this is you, from GDB, you're trying to talk to this, you're gonna do it, and you're gonna try to do some assembly code. I don't know why he didn't have assembly code in that particular slide, but I thought, um, we'd show it. And then the third problem is GDB doesn't know about virtual memory. And of course, the kernel and user land are all running in virtual memory, okay? And so um, it's, it's an interesting problem that goes in there. And then the next thing that comes in is bootloaders. Well, okay, use printf as the solution for that. So bootloaders here is apparently a big thing that, uh, goes in there. In fact, I've run into the same problem myself. I'll mention that in a little while here. So the idea here is you have several bootloaders. You have the zero stage bootloader that's in ROM that loads your first stage bootloader from SD or ROM, which then loads from your SD card, your SBI, and your operating system. 
And so it turns out that uh, you know, your SBI payload is your operating system. So again, this is a situation where, well, if you're doing it this way, you've got to statically link the, S the operating system into SBI, just like you had to do in BBL, which of course is again a pain. You don't want to do that. You want to try to find a way where your OS is not actually having to be linked into your bootloader to, to go for it. So then you, you look at the next one here. So what we end up doing then is we go the zero bootloader the first stage bootloader, now we put the SBI and U-boot together, and then the U-boot can finally load the operating system. So your SBI is running in machine mode, your U-boot ends up running in your supervisor mode, and then loads the operating system from where it needs to, and then runs it. But of course, U-boot has to understand SBI to be, because U-boot is now talking to SBI. And so there's another issue that's floating, floating around is trying to do that. Well, this should be the way it worked, but it turned out that the final one that, he, that Dylan actually used to get it up and booting and actually to the point where it was running was we ended up using a U-boot uh, loader as the first stage. So you still have the zero stage boot loader, but the first stage is then a U-boot SPL that then produces gets this SBI U-boot together, which then talks to the operating system. And of course, once the operating system run is running, now it talks back to SBI to, to uh, get all its um, SBI stuff done that it needs to do. And so this is how he actually finally got this, this up and running on the Sci-5 in there. So what is the uh, thing here? Um, well, the final boot then is you have an EFI partition that has your EFI boot and then your boot risk 64 EFI. And then you have actually in your boot partition, you have all your device tree blobs um, for a bunch of them in that area. And then of course on the NetBSD partition, you have your kernel here and there where you can do it. And now with this arrangement, then you can actually change your kernel out in the FSS part partition and just, just reboot and things should work. Okay, and so that's kind of the final situation here. So what is the final result then here? Oh, well, yeah. The other thing too now is I didn't mention here, I didn't find, I didn't go back and look, but sometime between 2019 and 2022, we actually got full cross-build tools inside the build tree. And so it was in about 2021 that I think, uh, before 2021 that they actually started saying we can start running some standard builds with all the cross-build tools to see if we can build all the user, user land programs. Um, and so the standard image now that has the EFI boot, the NetBSD partition, um, is now built by the standard build.sh. Does just a great job. Um, and so that's what we have. So the final result then here is NetBSD able to boot on the high five. Again, it gets to the point where it wants to load the root, the root file partition. And this is where we have the problem now is there are no drivers. NetBSD didn't have drivers for any of the hardware on this device, so all of a sudden, okay, now we've got it to this point, now we've got the driver problem rather than um, something else. So I, I, essentially, both my grad students got it to the point where we want to mount root, but on a different situation, and now we're, they ran out of time, and. Well, so you say, okay, you've learned a lot by doing this, but now we're at this point. So that's a, um, a thing there. So what did we have here? It does not have existing drivers for the cart clock controller, the SD card, the network, all the kinds of stuff, all the hardware that you really need to make that thing work. There are no um, drivers for it. And the, probably the chance that somebody's gonna actually sit down and write those drivers is pretty low because this particular board is kind of the early board and there's a bunch of other stuff coming out and there's probably no reason to go back and make sure that works when we can have some other stuff working. Okay, so that brings up the next one is the Beagle V Starlight. Okay, well, this was one that Nick Hudson was working on and he's actually had some progress here he actually has NetBSD running on this board. Now, a bunch of the same similar issues came up. The flattened device tree, all the bootloaders and stuff like that. And it turns out that the 
Beagle 5 is not distributed with a U-boot that understands SBI, SB, SBI version 1.0. So you have to build your own special U-boot to be able to get that. Well, Nick did that, and so he's got it going here. This is the, the U-boot he needed here. And then um, the ARM FTD was uh, adapted for the RISC-V. So that's going there. It didn't, you couldn't just kind of use it directly from where it was in the ARM5 ARM thing, but you adapted it in there. So that's work that Nick did here. And then he did a bunch of P PMAP fixes. And then uh, some con to get the drivers going, of course, you need the config glue that glues the existing driver with the autocomp system that gets it all going up there. And so one of the reasons that all you really had to do was the glue was because NetBSD supports the ARM-based Beagle boards. And they basically took, as far as I can tell, they basically took the ARM-based chip out and stuck the uh, uh, RISC-V chip in with the associated stuff to do it, but most of the other chips all remained the same. The network was the same. The SD card stuff was all the same. They just simply changed which CPU is in there. So because NetBSD had the support for the Beagle board, then there wasn't much driver work to actually get there. Okay, and so, um, there was apparently a bunch of fixes to the dynamic loader too at runtime that he had to work on. So this is what Nick reports as being kind of what it took him to get it actually running on this thing here. And so he says it's pretty solid. So um, that's uh, what he claims is very stable on this platform now. And I'm like, that's cool. I've got this talk to do, so let's go ahead and get a, a Beagle 5, and I want to actually just demonstrate it and run it out of my thing. So I went out and bought a Beagle 5, right? Except for he forgot to tell me it was the Starlight, okay? So I ended up getting a Beagle 5 Fire and looked at it. Once I finally got it in my hand, I went, oh, this doesn't even have HDMI out. I'm going to have to do serial, okay? And then I went, oh, well, there's the one that has HDMI out on it. That's the Beagle 5 Ahead. Well, let's try that. So I got my Beagle 5 Ahead here. I was going to do something with it here, but of course, it has, again, the same U-boot problem. And it turns out that apparently you have to build a unique U-boot for, for the Beagle 5 Ahead. You can't use the Beagle 5 Starlight U-boot for it. So we're again back to that bootloader issue to get things going here. And then of course, the DTB, the d device tree, I don't have a device tree blob or the stuff for that. So here is what the current state of the RISC-V port is, okay? It works on QMU and it works on the Beagle V Starlight. So yes, it is running on RISC, okay? But there's a lot of work still left to do to get it so Every, everybody else can actually go and run it. For one thing, the U-boot that Nick is using is not anywhere available. It's not in the, in the source tree. It's in his own source tree. And so I can't go out and grab it and build it just with my standard tools. I have to know what I'm doing, which I hadn't, unfortunately didn't have enough time to get there. Needs work? Well, this sci 5 Hymus Unleashed is almost there, but it needs a whole bunch of work to get there, primarily drive. The Star 5 Vision 2, also another board that I bought a while ago, because it was like, hey, that's a cheap RISC-V board. It, you can get it up and running. Again, you have to get the right U-boot, the right boot stuff all going, and then you can get it up and running. But there, of course, about all you can do is run, uh, boot out of a RAM disk because you're missing drivers for the SD card and all the other stuff. So it's again very similar. It comes from the same point. Um, so the hardware in those are, are very definitely different. So then we end up with the Beagle V Fire and the Beagle V Ahead. Those are going to be needing some work to get going, but I suspect that those are going to be the next targets because they're the closest ones in here. And so I am hoping that by Midsummer, I'm going to actually have a, one of those running here because I've got both of those going, and that's um, getting a new port run is to me a very interesting thing to do. So here's your essentially your future work: more driver support, start figuring out what the other platforms are, and more driver support. And uh, I also discovered that there are actually a number of RISC-V uh, uh, boards out there. I actually, there's one little tiny one that's like. 10 bucks, 
go out and buy it for 10 bucks. Uh, now, I don't know what useful it is. I mean, there's some other stuff on it, but there's some stuff in there. And then um, this is Dylan thought that live SBI, SBI support should be considered because currently NetBSD does a bunch of its own SBI calls instead of using kind of a standard interface. And live SBI actually has a bunch of a standard interface for calling this. So this is essentially the SBI um, call interface. And instead of having NetBSD do their own thing, he thought that that should be the case. So that's kind of where, where it's at. So at this point, I actually wanted to show you something working here. Let's see here. This is where I need to turn this sideways so I can see what I'm doing here. And we'll get this. Where did we go? There's the mouse. Um, and in here, I have a RISC-64 and a NetBSD generic 64 ready to run. These were built, both of these were built by the standard build.sh. You just go in, build distribution, boom, you get it done. Here's what you got, OK? And so that's good. I tried it and looked in there and found the stuff. And I didn't want to type this to get it going. So I figured I'd put that in the actual uh, uh, thing here so I can just do an sh run risk 5 and then it does uh, starts running this and you quickly could have seen that uh, SBI go by here and so here is now NetBSD booting on QAMU using risk in there one of the things I noticed pretty quickly though here is DHCP cores I decided not to try to fix that just to show you kind of that the while it is working pretty good um, they still have a, a little bit that's going in here and so we get up here, it gets going, we do all the standard boot stuff. And when we finally get the, the boot prompt, I can go in here and actually log in. And we have it, uname minus A, there we go. And so you can actually see that I built this on my home machine. I did, it, this isn't a standard build that anybody else, so just anybody can go in and build this now and run your stuff on QMU. So it is working on this environment. Now, we should be able to take the same image, which also has that NetBSD on it. So if we ls slash uh, here, we'll see that it has, um, there's the NetBSD, so it can boot directly from NetBSD. So this image should be able to, once you get the proper U-boot stuff and everything going, I should be able to be able to boot this image on the uh, Beagle 5, whichever version I actually have it going. I do have to, of course, make sure that I can get the uh, console working. I have not been able to actually see any console output on any of those devices, even when I'm running Linux. I've tried to figure out how to, which device in Linux I can talk on the console co so I can make sure I actually can do console work on it, and I still haven't quite got there. So if we look at boot, um, this is the, that, we'll get the right name on there. Okay, so we then see this is where we're in. We have the boot risk 65 EFI. We then have our different uh, things for the definitions of what we have here. So we then have a couple of uh, Beagle V Starlight. Uh, these are the device tree blobs that are available. So th these are there for U boot to actually stick in, in memory and then hand off the pointers to where they're stuck in memory to. NetBSD, so NetBSD can see it. So we also need to get some more um, de uh, device tree blobs for the BeagleV fire and the BeagleV ahead to be able to actually get started on that. So those, that's kind of some of the work that's actually going there. So um, any questions or comments or anything? Well, so it's, um, it's probably that it just had the basic core required, and then a lot of the other extension stuff weren't there. But apparently, GDB was wanting the floating point instructions to do stuff with. And so that was what was causing the issue, was that GDB was trying to, thought that the core was more performant than it was, and so GDB just couldn't, couldn't deal with it, apparently. Yes, well, yeah, apparently the on-chip debugger, it, well, the on-chip debugger, first of all, 
when you get in there, that's, that basically starts a GDB server is what it's supposed to start. So you're actually using GDB to talk with it, okay? And it says the real, the one issue was if you, if you had your, your, again, this is my understanding of what Dylan ran into. I didn't deal with that directly. But it was like he would go in and try to do this and it would corrupt the bootloader he was using. And so you'd have to go fix the bootloader and then try again. And so each, every time you tried to debug, you'd have to go fix something. Well, the, that he was trying, see the problem is he was getting no output, nothing was happening, and he was trying to figure out what was going on. And so it was like, he's trying at that, trying to debug the whole booting process to get to the point where the kernel actually got him some output. And it, it was just this big mess of, okay, let's try to use the GDB to figure out what's going on. Let's step through the process of getting to starting the kernel. And he ran into all these different problems. Okay, and that's kind of what was happening. It was this just, he spent probably six months actually trying to get something out of the serial port on that, on that board, which was crazy. And I mean, he's, he's a pretty good guy. I'm pretty confident in his, his stuff. I mean, in other places, he's, he was just doing great stuff. And he was talking with Zach, who's still around. He was talking with other people who we, uh, we have another NetBSD guy there, uh, Aaron Clausen. He's not done a lot of work in NetBSD, but he had some good stuff. And so he was banging off all three of us who had NetBSD experience about how to get where he needed to go. And it was just a, a big, a long trudge. And he finally got past some of these things to, and then he could get it going. I think that's probably the major thing that he was doing is the, the board was not acting like he was expecting. And he, he, and the debugging tools didn't work like they were advertised to. Yes. Yeah, and they had code and other stuff like that, um, but he could not get that working immediately from what they have, and that was the that was kind of the big thing that he ran into was he could not duplicate what they were doing. It, it, after reading a bunch of stuff, the Risk Five sounds very Linuxy to me. That it was kind of built the, the kinds of boards and stuff. It feels like it was built to run Linux. And so trying to run anything else, you've got to try to make it fit into what they're looking for. And so that's, that's what it seems to me. Um, you know, I had frustrations trying to get this board here. Like I said, I've not been able to actually get any um, serial port working on it. Even when I let it run Linux, and then I thought, OK, let's try to find the TTY it is and see if we can actually talk across the, the, the serial port. It's like, I can do it. That's, I ran out of time because I was doing that a couple weeks ago. Because um, I wanted to actually have it coming here and say, here, here's, here's the actual hardware, here it's running, but didn't get there. Yes? I think, um, yeah, PMAT, PMAT common is really that good thing there. Uh, like I said, I didn't, I didn't actually uh, um, do the PMAT for the PC532, so I did kind of the rest. And I, of course, ripped off a uh, disk driver from one of the Apple ports. Um, you know, I think it was the, I forget exactly which one it was, but. Um, that, I think, trying to get, yeah. Zach was actually spent a lot of time with PMAP2 before he actually, he, he tried playing with PMAP Common and it still was kind of not in that state. And like uh, uh, Nick had to do a little work with PMAP Common to get it actually working. But it was, it was not like you had to redo the whole PMAP. Um, one of the things that apparently is pretty crazy um, is when you're running in supervisor mode, when you turn on mapping, you get a page fault immediately, period. There's no question. You just you turn on mapping, page fault immediately. You can't even start running any other code. So they've used uh, um, other OSs have actually just simply says, OK, what we're going to do is we're going to turn on mapping and we're going to put in the where to go when you page fault 
to the place we want you to run in the kernel. So when you turn on, when you do that first initial turn on mapping, it, init it just page faults to the place where you really want it to go, and then you can update the, the stuff for the correct page faults later on. And I think that was a thing that was actually causing issues. And so I personally felt like I had a much easier time on the PC 532 than, I, than Zach had on the RISC V. Because I think I, I did most of my work um, in three months, and he worked on it for a year. <laughs> well, uh, I don't know that it's totally backwards. Um, it's just that you, you know, you're dealing with a different architecture, and they do some crazy things. So. I didn't. Oh, really? Okay. Well, it was for me. Because I certainly when I was on the PC 532, it didn't do that. I could. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're, if you if you go that way. Now I'm I'm pretty sure, and I haven't tried this with my my little OS I wrote that runs in machine mode and user mode and totally ignores supervisor mode. I did that on purpose to try to push the idea of um, physical address space and mapped address space on my users on my students. So they had to they had to deal with the difference that you couldn't have you know your kernel running in a mapped address space. So you had to actually run it through your heads. But so I'm expecting that if I actually tried to get that running, I could actually produce the equivalent of the first level bootloader that would actually be my OS and, and just totally ignore that boot thing. And I could probably do that. I don't, I, but when you go through the standard stuff they're looking at, first level, the, the uh, zeroth level, first level, and then go with the SBI and the U, uh, U boot. You're then, once you load the uh, SBI, you're then running in that situation where SBI inhabits the, the machine mode, and you're then your OS inhabits supervisor mode. Now, you can probably, I'm, I'm expecting at some point somebody's going to replace SBI with an actual full hypervisor type thing where you can actually then run multiple different OSs on top of this um, because you can run, do that. So you can then, with the memory, the, the hardware memory stuff, you can say, oh, well, this, hard, this hunk of memory is for this OS, this hunk of memory is for that OS, and do some stuff like that. So it does have a lot of features in there, but if you're going with SBI, you're going to be running, the, your kernel is running in supervisor mode, and all you get to do is call SBI to get your stuff done. I don't think so. I don't, no. Yeah, you're loading the SBI. That's part of, that's part of, that was part of, if we go back to that bootloader there, um, where'd we go here? Um, yeah, so here's the bootloader here. So here's the U-boot SPL, so that's the second, the first level booter. Here's the zeroth, zeroth um, bootloader. We then do this U-boot SPL that then actually boots SPI and U-boot. You could put something else completely in there. Okay, so it's, the silicon's not forcing you to use SBI. It's just simply saying, this is the way to make it portable. If you wanted to, you could pull out that whole thing, put a different uh, first level bootloader in there and do whatever you want to because the silicon's not stopping you as far as I know. So the zero, the, the zero, uh, the zero stage bootloader is what's in ROM and that's what it, what it does. And it, try, it then goes out and finds either um, your U-boot or something else, OK? And so um, that's, that's where it's actually going. So your, your zero stage bootloader is what is actually the, the lowest level bootloader that you're working with. And all the rest of that is trying to provide stuff where it's kind of looking. This is machine independent because you can use SBI. So you can then do your 
operating system to only talk to SBI and you don't care what the machine stuff you're actually working with because you can just ask the SBI to do what you want. Yeah, okay. Other questions? Thank you for coming.